Herodotus, the son of Croesus. Hello, this is Bertie, and I'm here with the latest instalment from the histories of Herodotus. First, I would like to thank Audible for sponsoring this episode, and at the end of this story, I will recommend a free audiobook from Audible that fans of Herodotus will love to listen to. It's a book that I found fascinating and informative, so hang on for details. I told you last time about King Croesus of Lydia, who was famous for being mega, mega rich. He himself was certain that he was the happiest man alive, and you might think that he had good reason for his opinion. But if you look at the story through Greek eyes, it was certain that something terrible was about to happen to Croesus after he boasted of his wealth to Solon, the wise man of Athens. In Greek myths and plays, people who become too big-headed always come to a sticky end. Herodotus tells us bluntly, the anger of the gods was coming for Croesus. And this was clearly because he had boasted that he was the happiest of men. And he soon had a dream which showed him the evil that was about to befall his eldest son. Croesus had two sons, one of whom Herodotus does not name, was deaf and mute. The other, Ates, had it all, wealth, wit, looks and courage. He was the handsome prince from a fairy tale and the pride and joy of his father. But one night Croesus dreamt that Ates was killed by an iron spear. He woke up in a great fright, certain that his dream was a sign from the gods. Sometimes the stories of Herodotus play out a little like fairy tales. If you know the story of Sleeping Beauty, you will recall that a bad fairy predicted that Princess Talia would prick her finger on a spinning wheel. Her father, the king, tried to avoid this dreadful fate by ordering all the spinning wheels in the land to be destroyed. After his terrible dream, Croesus had similar ideas to protect his son from fate. He removed all weapons, especially spears, from the men's part of the palace and instead stashed them away in the women's quarters where there would be no risk of one of them accidentally dropping onto his son. And then the king forbade his son to go anywhere near the army, even though he was one of its leaders. And finally... Croesus married Artes off to a nice girl and told him to settle down and keep well away from spears. You might think that these were sensible precautions, but in Greek tales, anyone who tries to dodge their destiny like this is always caught out. I'll give you an example from a famous myth. There was once a sea nymph called Thetis. Her son, Achilles, was destined to lead a glorious but short life. Naturally, the mother wanted to save him from the fate of an early death, and so she dipped the baby Achilles in the river Styx. The waters of the river, which led into the underworld, were supposed to make a person safe from any injury. But Thetis held on to the baby's heel, and that part of his foot was not washed by the magical water. Achilles grew up to be the world's mightiest warrior, but he could not escape destiny. Prince Paris of Troy fired a poisoned arrow that caught him on the back of the foot, and he died the early death fated by the gods at birth. And that's where we get the phrase, Achilles' heel, which means a vulnerable spot. So, you get the idea. King Croesus was not able to save his son, from destiny. It happened like this. The land of Phrygia, where King Midas lived, was part of the Lydian Empire. It so happened that the grandson of Midas, a young man called Adrastus, accidentally killed his own brother. As a punishment, he was sent into exile. This unfortunate young man came to Croesus at his palace in Sardis and begged for mercy. Croesus was generous-hearted, and told him, Our families are allies. You are among friends here. They performed a ceremony to rid Adrastus of his blood guilt. 
Then he began his new life in the palace. Croesus treated him as one of his own sons. Around this time, in another part of the empire of Lydia, a giant wild boar was causing trouble. The monster trampled the crops and terrified the local people. They sent to Croesus to ask for help. Hunting wild boar was a noble and heroic pastime. It was just the job for a gutsy young prince. It seemed quite natural for Croesus to send Artes to finish off this troublesome pig, but Croesus refused to risk his son's life. When Artes was told he had to sit at home and not lead the hunt, he feared that people would call him a coward. Besides, he was bored with life in the palace and thirsted for adventure. He begged and begged his father to let him take up the challenge, saying, Father, I respect your concern for me, but fate did not decree that I would be killed by a crazy pig. What kind of boar fights with an iron spear? It's a tusk that we have to contend with here. Eventually, Croesus saw the logic of his son's argument, but he was still concerned for his safety. So he called Adrastus and said, I took you in when your luck was down. I treated you as one of my family. Now please repay my favour. Be my son's bodyguard. Watch over him every minute. Protect him from any attack by bandits or villains on this trip. Adrastus replied humbly, saying that he was not worthy of the honour, especially as he had accidentally killed his own brother. But since Croesus insisted, he would, of course, follow his orders to the very best of his ability. The young men and the hunting party travelled to the mountain where the boar was rampaging. They tracked the beast down and cornered him, but the fate of the gods could not be avoided. It so happened that Adrastus took aim at the wild boar with his spear, threw it and missed the creature, instead hitting Artes, son of Croesus, and killing him. They returned to the city of Sardis with the body of the king's son. Croesus was distraught. Adrastus, who had now twice killed someone by accident, was ready to die. But Croesus understood that a greater power was responsible for the death of his son and forgave him. It seems that Croesus had some good qualities. He was generous and forgiving, even when he was stricken by grief. And you might think that the gods had now punished Croesus enough for his boastfulness and pride and that fatal quality which the Greeks called hubris. But in the next episode I will let you know how he was tricked once again by fate and predictions of the future. If you've listened this far, you must be interested in the ancient world. And of course, you like audiobooks too. Who doesn't? You can listen to them in the car, in the bath, at home, while you're falling asleep. They're great, which is why we've partnered with Audible. And I'm going to recommend an audiobook which I think you'll love. My favourite author on the ancient world is Tom Holland. His book Persian Fire is particularly good on the origins of the incredible Persian Empire. He also explains the origins of Greek civilization and tells the story of the Persian Wars in a compelling way. You can listen to his Persian Fire for free. It's read by the excellent actor Andrew Sachs. What you need to do is go to audible.com forward slash storynori or text Story Nori to 500-500. You can sign up for a 30-day free trial. I'm sure Herodotus fans will particularly enjoy Tom Holland's Persian Fire, but you can pick any book you like from Audible's massive selection. The details will be on our website, but a great place to start is audible.com forward slash Story Nori, or text the word story nori, S-T-O-R-Y-N-O-R-Y, to 500-500. Now, we don't do sponsorship messages very often, but every time we do, people ask if they can have an advertising-free version of the story. Well, this time I'm going to upload this story without the Audible advertisement 
to our Patreon page and our Patreon subscribers can get it for free. But I hope everyone else will find the recommendation of Tom Holland's excellent Persian firebook useful. For now, from me, Bertie. Till next time, goodbye.